Hello, welcome to a sort of remote Sonic Lab presentation. We've not done one of these before, but we're going to give it a damn good try. And uh, I'm here with uh, George Rees, who's uh, from Softube. Uh, he's based in Sweden uh, in a very delightfully uh, apportioned studio there. We've only seen one view, but you might have seen some of his other videos. Uh, George is doing a lot of the video and product stuff for Softube. And today we're looking at uh, the Console One, which has recently undergone a kind of transformation in that it became cheaper, uh, the manufacture process came a little bit more uh, um, solid so we end up with a net result is cheaper to you most of you probably know what console one is but in case you don't i'm going to ask george just to kind of go over what console one actually is and and hello george how are you <laughs> yeah hi nick nice to see you yes um well console one it's funny because i find that um even if people think that they know they've got the score with console one it's a, a controller of some sort uh, it's worth going back to the very beginning and just explaining that it's a lot more than a, a, a basic assignable MIDI controller. It is in fact a hardware and software hybrid mix system which allows you to assign a channel strip to any number of channels in your DAW of choice. So this works in uh, any major DAW and what you do is you load up, as I have here in Studio One, a Console One plugin on each channel and then when you press the display on button on your hardware unit you enter into the console one ecosystem as it were and you can start to tweak knobs on channel one channel two three four and set up your entire mix from one simple uh, hardware surface and the beauty of it though is that there is also audio processing going on um, not in the unit itself but in in software in the plugin so we sell the unit with a uh, model, a high quality uh, analog model of the SSL 4000 console uh, E-series, which uh, you can see in my top corner of my screen there. Uh, and the sound of that desk is included with the lovely hardware workflow too. So you get the best of both worlds. You have the kind of versatility and uh, expandability of working in software, DAW environment, but you also have the ease of use and the workflow advantage of having the knobs laid out there in front of you, learning where they all are. You can work very quickly with something like this and you can always have your best sounds on tap. So that's the, the kind of the long and short of it. That's the basic version. And then the only thing worth talking about is all the exciting kind of is uh, all the, the other stuff. Things. The yeah. interesting thing about it is, I mean, as as we know, you know, that in in certainly in you know synth and software world, the idea of a sort of holy grail of a hardware controller that will work in a majority of situations is very is is tantalisingly difficult to get. Whereas what you've done is you've taken it for mixed purposes. I, I wanted to ask one question: Is it possible to use the uh, the con console one as a kind of generic MIDI controller as well, so to map the control outputs, do you get access to it at that level? It isn't. It isn't actually possible to do that, and that was a very deliberate, uh, conscious choice on on the part of Softube's uh, engineers not to make it that, because we want this story to be understood of a basic channel strip functional mixer, um, and it is, you know, in theory possible to assign this knob to do whatever you want, but uh, if we start allowing it to be a generic controller then the real beauty of the system is lost which is that it very carefully boils down the key controls for 80 90 percent of your mixing and puts them right in front of you with the best sound on tap and uh, it, it makes your your workflow as a, a mix engineer or as a, a producer that much quicker because it's simplified so I, I often say it's much more and much less than a an, an assignable MIDI controller but if you're and if you're actually you know mixing a lot of the time, I mean I know you've got quite a lot of studio experience yourself. I mean the fact of being able to grab a hardware control. I mean you know many of us kind of think, oh it's a shame we've you know mixing desks are just not around anymore, are we? We're often mixing directly in and out of our sound card. So this kind of provides sure. a tactile experience, right? Well, yeah, and for a number of reasons, the the, the old fashioned kind of large format desk is a thing of the past to a large extent, but. This provides, as I say, kind of the, the best of that world with a lot of the best of the software world as well. Because if you grab a console one and turn it up on its end and add 63 more, that's essentially what you've got is an old format SSL desk. But we've boiled it down. Obviously, in the digital world, you can have just one of everything and assign um, you know, track numbers to a bunch of buttons at the top. We also have paging up and down so that if you have more than 20 tracks in your mix, you can select... Mm -hmm. 
21 to 40 and so on and so on. That's all um, boiled down into this one small box. So obviously it's a lot more affordable. Um, it's in many ways more robust because there actually isn't a lot of clever processing going on in this hardware unit. The clever processing is happening in the DSP, the software. Um, but you have the, the very same feel and the grabability, the speed of work that you get with a large format console, perhaps even more because you're not leaning over there to do snare drum and over there to do guitar. You're, everything's right there in front of you so you can kind of keep your ears between the speakers and do your best work. So uh, it comes with the SSL uh, channel strip. I mean, can you drop that across buses as well and access that or does it have to be? Yeah, I mean, exactly. You certainly can. So I've got, um, for example, a, a drum bus here at number 26 on which I have in fact loaded up our newest console emulation. Uh, so I, uh, you can put the SSL that comes as standard across any bus you like. I think maybe I've got it on my main bus. No, I've got the British Class A on my main bus. I might as well mention at this point then that there's, <laughs> there's all these lovely expansion software um, emulations that uh, you can buy separately from the system. And we're you know, excited to be able to offer that aspect of things as well because uh, the beauty of having both hardware and software in your system is that you can have that, as I say, the hardware workflow, the speed, the uh, grabability, but you can also have that enormous versatility that we all um, come to sort of uh, know and love in software. And we've gotten very used to the ability to just grab a quick piece of that sound world and then grab that for your snare drum and this compressor for vocals and that EQ for, you know, so being able to continue to do that while using a piece of hardware is um, where it's all at for us. Excellent. So I, I, I'm, I'm guessing you've got a kind of uh, basic flow of you know stuff that you want to show us. We should probably uh, take a look at that. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, I, there's um, so much that it's uh, <laughs> it's always uh, time consuming to go through it all. But um, beyond the basic functionality, as I say, which is that of a channel strip with a gate and, and transient shaper, an EQ, a compressor and a kind of output saturation section. And um, what this does is, as I say, allows you to access a bunch of different sound colors, sound worlds from one unit. So if you press shift and, um, hold on, let me find the mic, there we are, my drum bus, for example. If I press shift and strip, I get a list of the available channel strips. So we have a, uh, a model, as I say, which comes with the unit of the SSL 4000 series console, but we also have the um, famed Hi-Fi 9K uh, series there and a British Class A, which is based on kind of delicious, creamy British units of the 60s and 70s. Um, we have a console emulation based on our Summit Audio units and uh, new, an American Class A console, which like the British Class A, is based on the absolute classic desks of the American uh, music making variety. And uh, all of these different options are great for different things. Of course, you know, it, we think the SSL is a great kind of workhorse desk, the 4000. Um, became known for kind of rock work and pop work, but you can use it on more or less anything. But there are times when you want that um, American sound, a real kind of crunch in your drum bus, for example, which is what I've got loaded up here. So I just press OK and suddenly I'm using a completely different mixing console just on my drum bus. And if I move back over to my vocals there, I'm SSL. So you can build up your own kind of modular Franken desk or whatever. Um, you can even get down to the smallest details and sub in and out individual sections. So you could, for example, bring up a list of compatible EQ plugins, which can slide in on a particular channel. There's a bunch of UA and software, uh, Softube plugins available to be com uh, combined with this system. So we might choose to use our uh, Summit Audio EQF there and suddenly we've got the framework of that American Class A desk, but we've also got the Summit Audio EQ, there it comes. So we can start to adjust our tonality in that way, but uh, it's all entirely personalizable, customizable to an individual mix. And of course you can save these as templates and uh, uh, so on and so forth. So it's all really just about boiling down the functionality that you're gonna need on a day-to-day -day basis, and making it as accessible as possible without sacrificing quality because it's easy to make things um, simple and easy to use but uh, what you don't want to do is take away the uh, high quality of sound or the high quality of, uh, of usability that people rightly expect in this day and age you know. Yeah sure I mean I noticed you've got you've not gone for a sort of skeuomorphic approach to the GUI it's very representational of the parameters rather than the look and the feel of it 
Was that sure? Co- yeah, uh, that's an interesting choice. I mean, I guess you're you're trying to get people to focus on what's the hardware in front of them rather than what's on the screen, right? Well, yeah, and and also to focus on their music rather than the beautiful GUIs. I mean, it's it's partly a, a functional choice that it it becomes very difficult to load the graphics of all of these mm. different beautiful units into the individual sections of uh, this framework plugin that we've developed, the Console One plugin. But um, it's also a really great thing to be able to uh, rely on your equipment to look the same every time you use it so that you can concentrate on listening to what you want to listen to. We even have um, this mode button in the top which changes view modes through, um, you can have the uh, curves but you can also have the knobs laid out in front of you or even bring it down to a small meter bridge at the bottom of the screen so that when I uh, press play you, you can see your door session in the background, you're not distracted by uh, the the, the oh, right. work in front of you but if you if you t- start tweaking knobs you'll still hear the changes to your EQ your compressor settings and so forth and you can skip through to whatever channel you want to work on and start getting busy yeah so the navigation part of it I mean it's presumably very straightforward I mean does it work both ways so if you select a channel with the mouse god forbid you might want to use the mouse will it <laughs> select the same the, uh, the, the 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 same channel do you know for what? the hardware it, doesn't do that in reverse that's a very good question but oh oh do you know what you found something i didn't know it does look at that hey well, what fun hey wonderful yeah and this is a feature that actually doesn't work in all daws i should make clear um the uh control of door parameters is only available in certain um mm. daws who have come on board with us and made sure that theirs is um as compatible as possible so studio one um reaper uh, cubase recently came on board with uh, this additional functionality which just makes it easier to control your entire session from the console one hardware i can solo and mute for example or i can take control of the daw faders and the pan and so forth even send levels and so forth from the console one it's all about eliminating the mouse because useful though they are they are um kind of uh, jacks of all trades and masters of none and is there a, 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 a generally preferred route? Say, for instance, you know, you, obviously you've got your channel strip side of things, but then if I wanted some other processing on that channel that Console mm. One wasn't involved in, is it best to put it sure. before, or, is it before or after, or doesn't it really matter where that additional plugin goes well, in the chain? It's entirely up to you. I mean, I tend to um, slap a Console One plugin across pretty much every channel in a mix before I do anything else, just so that I can treat it like a, a desk. I'll do my basic processing my gating eqing compression whatever and then move on to other things i can obviously use my daw in any way i could before it's not taking away any functionality so i would then throw in other inserts or sends after the event but there's absolutely no reason you can't use console one on the return of a reverb and and mess it up with some of the saturation from console one Um, so it's you know it's versatile in that sense you can you can route it however you like so the, these plugins that, uh, that that come with, or the, the channel strips that come, are they all plug-in versions as well? So can you see a kind of GUI'd version, if you wish, or is it... Right, it's a very interesting question, actually, because the answer until very recently was no. Um, the American Class A, the new uh, channel strip which came out this month, is the first one that we have made a, a standalone version of as well. Um, and it remains to be seen, I have my fingers crossed, but it remains to be seen whether we will... Uh, find the resources to uh, to go back in time and make the old channel strips available as uh, uh, standalone plugins. But certainly people are seeming pretty excited about the fact that they can use the American Class A as a standalone. And I will show it to you right now, if I possibly can. Uh, it looks like... So uh, it looks like this. And right, this is okay. uh, familiar to anyone who's used Console One because it's laid out very much the same. But we have our... Um, filters on the left are gate and shaper we have eq we have compression and drive or saturation based on the desk saturation on the right hand side master volume etc um, but what it also has is an awful lot of lovely visuals which can uh, be utilized up at the top of the screen here but uh, yeah this is the mouseable version and if you buy this plugin you get the console one american class a license as well so it's a sort of a, a both in one and um, while we're on the subject of console one, I mean the actual basic package. Do you have any information on the pricing on that? Just purely because it's—I uh, know it was reduced quite recently. Well, uh, yeah. So, well, it's um, 
been pretty constant for the last uh, little over a year actually, but it's uh, it came down in price when we released the Mark II version quite significantly because of the um, manufacturing um, uh, changes that you described at the beginning. Um, so it started off console one, the system, including the channel strip plug-in, the emulation of the SSL desk at about um, 11 or $1,200 US, which sounds like an awful lot now because the price these days is more like $500 US. Um, so, you know, 400 pounds, 420 euros, whatever, that kind of region. Um, and uh, that includes, as I say, the SSL strip, uh, which gives you the sound of uh, 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 everything you might like, but also the workflow is all there. Um, the additional uh, sounds, the other channel strips, the uh, compatible plugins are all sold separately, but any SoftTube or UA plugins that you already own will be immediately ready to go in your console one system. So it will, uh, there's no kind of mapping required. And that's the real key to the beauty of this thing is you don't have to be uh, spending all day setting it up so that you can use it. It just knows what to do with, because uh, we've done all that work for you. That's I'm guessing idea. when you're t when you're talking UAD, it's it's generally uh, EQs, gates, compressors, and whatnot. I mean, it won't do reverb. Yeah, that's so, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So no. Although uh, this is another um, you know demonstration of the fabulousness of working with both hardware and software. We have now uh, developed a brand new mode for console one. This was uh, at the end of last year. If I could just bring up the full visual um, again, um, if you press shift and mode, you enter what's known as Apollo central mode. And if you're a UAD person with an Apollo uh, interface, you can start to take control of your tracking process. You take control of the uh, UA console software from this mode. So instead of controlling uh, a plugin in your DAW, you control plugins in the input section, as it were, in your UAD um, input. So you can use unison preamps in zero latency and so on. UAD has, uh, has, has not really opened up, the, certainly the MIDI control of the console side of things at all. So uh, well done for getting it. Well, sure. <laughs> that's, that's yeah, well, we're very deal. pleased with this. And, and they've been very uh, accommodating. And I think that's simply because they, they like the thing. They, uh, they see their users enjoying it and they use it themselves and they, uh, they see that it works. And, and we've been very, as I say, very restrictive for a reason ourselves about what we do and do not want console one to be able to do because um, it's... It, there's, you know, MIDI controllers out there, assignable MIDI controllers, 10 a penny, and you can uh, do everything badly. But what we want to be able to do is do what we do well. So this is now set up and pre-configured to take control of your tracking process. Let's say you're tracking a vocalist. You can load up a preset um, vocal chain with reverbs and with compressors and so forth into your um, input uh, strip on the, uh, the, the UA console. And you can start to tweak directly from your uh, console one surface here. Same thing if you're recording guitars, you can load a guitar amp and take control of everything from here as well. And that's all in kind of uh, zero latency, as it were, or near zero latency. And it's the same process for selecting which input or which track. It's just when you're in that mode. That yeah, exactly. So you just grab a hold of the buttons up at the top and you can um, track a whole band from one small control or, surface yeah or i mean and this would be really radical you could you could actually mix live couldn't you i mean like front of house i suppose yeah. if you were feeling yeah, you're not wrong yeah this is particularly since we got this apollo stuff uh, connected we can uh, we're seeing a lot of people doing that and uh, using it even to control um, basic kind of synth setups we have a, a a friend in america called todd urban who made a little video about controlling very basic kind of um uh synth triggers and so forth from console one so there's some very exciting possibilities when it comes to uh, this zero latency tracking functionality. But that's exactly the point. I hate to keep repeating myself, but the beauty of it is you've got this lovely hardware and all the advantages that come with that, but there's a never ending um, world of possibilities for what this can do because it's all the brains are in software. Is it possible to have more than once uh, on a system? So you could have one dedicated to just UAD input tracking and one dedicated to DAW channels? That's actually a very good question. I've never tried that myself. Um, I think it probably is possible to uh, set up your inputs through one console one and your, um, your, your mix through another. But the beauty of it is that it's so easy to switch between the um, modes that you can flip back and forth very, very quickly and 
do everything from one surface. So just by pressing shift mode again, I'm back in my mix in my DAW and I can take control of that. But as soon as I want to go and change a little bit on the input, I press shift mode again and I'm back over to Apollo Central working that way. Um, people have, you know, tried out a few uh, options in terms of ganging these things and, and setting up more than one, but uh, I, I don't see the need personally. I suppose the only other thing that I would ask is, you know, it seems a shame that there's no fader. Right? It's, it's an output knob, but it's not. It's sure. Not, is it adjusting the actual output fader of the channel or is that the output of the channel strip? Well, in uh, the sort of mixing mode, um, as I say, in some DAWs, you have control directly over the door channel. Yes, the idea is that you can take control of the, uh, the door fader or the output volume of the plug-in, so to speak. Um, and that gives you lots of nice versatility in the mix if you want to um, level match and uh, start working. So there you see on, on uh, yeah, 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 the I screen see. there, my... Yeah. So I, I, and, can, um, I can see a Mark III with a motorised fader on the end of it. That would be a... That would, that, that oh, would well, that's be an a... interesting thought. <laughs> I'll pass the idea along to the <laughs> R&D department, sure. No, certainly faders are something that people have been asking us about ever since this thing came out. And it's a, a workflow advantage that a lot of, a lot of people are used to. Um, and uh, it's a big part of some people's workflow. So again, all I'll say about that is that we're not uh, in the business of rushing into doing something badly. Uh, and so we're carefully considering the, the best options sure. uh, for how to provide not just a kind of slapdash fix to that problem, but the very best way to, uh, to make faders work with uh, DAWs and with uh, digital uh, software emulations of wonderful sounding studio gear. Because what we don't want to do is make, you know, put all this effort into making the best sounding plugins out there, but then ruin it by schlocky systems and uh, and bad workflows so we're really taking our time and trying to do it properly yeah i mean it's very interesting i mean because i say we a... I'm, I'm not really yeah. involved in the development <laughs> i have to say i i just sit here smiling and saying what I, people I, have told I, I, me. i'm much the same yeah <laughs> i know um i mean because up until up until this really your only option was something like mackie control or mcu where you have very basic sure. parameter access but this sort of dedicated uh hardware control definitely kind of opens up this interaction between hardware soft. Is there anything else that you wanted to show us about um, the stuff we were going to talk about today? Well, no, I don't think so. I mean, the only thing I would do is to, to finish with my own little story about console one, which is that um, I was a, a soft tube customer before I was a, an employee and I was using one of these in my own small studio in the UK. And uh, the best kind of testimony I can give of its efficacy is my own. I found that I was spending all day just setting up the basic kind of EQ and compression on a mix with a mouse and suddenly I started using this thing and I was getting through the the kind of meat and potatoes part of mixing before lunch and all of a sudden I had all afternoon left over to play with clever reverbs and exciting instrument sounds and uh, even try and write proper songs occasionally so the thing frees up so much time that uh, it's it's really going to pay for itself for any serious mixer who's working regularly so that's that's my kind of bottom line with this thing. Yes I was wondering about you know what's this kind of CPU because obviously if you put in this across a large mix and you've got yeah. like, channel strips across each one and they're not UAD so you're using all of your onboard uh computer what what's you know is there a general rule of thumb for how many tracks you can get out of type of processor or is it uh, is it yeah well variable? I mean of course it 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 varies from computer to computer and and person to person but um it's been a real um uh touchstone of our philosophy that we try to develop our code as efficiently as possible because a lot of the stuff that we do is extremely detailed and extremely high quality. Our modular synth, for example, is very, very complicated in terms of the way that it processes audio in order to give the very best sound quality possible. So we've had um, a long history of making incredibly complicated stuff and then realizing it uses 9,000% of CPU. So we then have to go back to start and, and rewrite the code in a more efficient way and then do it again and do it again and do it again. And the guys working here in the, uh, in the SoftTube office have gotten very good at doing it. And the re result of that is that you can, on a moderately powerful laptop, which is what I always use to mix, you can run a console one plugin across 40, 50, 60 channels without realizing any kind of uh, issue I have found. And as I say, it differs from person to person. The only other thing I'll say about that is all of these individual sections in the channel strip can be switched off if they're not in use. So you can just run in 
turn off the equaliser on your shaker or your, your uh, drum room or whatever it is that you aren't using. You can, you can only gate the percussion stuff. You don't maybe want to use the gate on vocals. But in other channel strip plugins, you're always using the whole channel strip, whether you like it or not. With this one, we've kind of split it up into individual sections for that reason, so that you can always be efficient about your CPU usage. Okay, uh, one last question about this. I mean, uh, sure. obviously with this hands-on control side of things, uh, it's all of this automatable. So if you have a, you know, a track that's evolving and you're changing the EQ or you're changing the compressor, mm. can you use the Console 1 to automate all of those parameters via the Console 1 plugin framework? Yeah, well, certainly you have... I'll show you the most basic form of the plugin, which is like this. And this, just like any other plugin, um, is automatable and can be... Um, it can have automation written into it so that things evolve as your um, song moves forward. Um, it's also possible to use the knobs to write automation just as with um, any other controller, so that is um, accessible and useful uh, to save a lot of time over, again, just mouse clicking is very, very versatile but not very enjoyable for many things because it's not designed to do any one thing well. So you can grab a hold of a knob, do your business, yeah. And they're all, uh, I presume, are they all rotary encoders or are they fixed? Uh, no, travel? rotary encoders, exactly. Right. So you, uh, you, you don't need to kind of remember your place and there's no motorized uh, stuff here. It's all just bus powered because it's, yeah, um, rotary encoders. When you change to a new channel, it knows where you are and it will represent with these LEDs around the knobs where you are uh, on any given uh, control. So it's as simple as that. And again, that saves on the cost of the thing saves on the uh, the power usage. It means you can actually even take this out on the road with you and mix off your laptop's battery power because there's very little uh, heavy yeah, lifting going on in the hardware unit itself. So it's just a USB connection. That's it really, isn't it? That's it. USB bus powered, yeah. That's yeah. another reason we uh, <laughs> we didn't include a fader initially, yeah, in fact, because it would have cost a lot more but also would have drawn so much more power. Yes, I remember there was a, a, some little unit that, that that had a moving fader in it, but you had to plug a power supply in to have it move the fader. Sure, the, sure. Yeah. So I can understand why that would be happening. All about compromise in the end, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. So but this um, is I, the, the thing. We're trying to find the best the best boiled down compromise. Yeah. Okay. So um, what's what? where is this being used? I mean, you, you, I, I presume there's a long list of endorsees and stuff. I mean, have you found people using it sure. and you thought, well, I'm really surprised that they're not using their classic, you know, uh, DDA yeah, desk well, or whatever, you know, they're using <laughs> this instead? Exactly. I mean, uh, it's um, easy to boast about these things because we've, yeah, we've had some uh, very nice endorsements from some very big names. And uh, the, the thing that really surprises me and, and delights me, though, is that there are people who have access to original SSL consoles from the 70s and the 80s, and they use this as well. They buy it thinking, oh, maybe I'll take it home and do some tweaks or some practice. Um, and then they actually find themselves sitting it on the desk and <laughs> using it more and more often as they get used to it. They find the sound is the same. Um, they find the ease of use is equal or better, and they find that they don't have to keep calling the technician in to fix it. Um, and of course, they don't have to ask someone to come and recall their sessions either, because it uh, does it all for you. It's funny, isn't it? So that, that's the real exciting thing. More and more studios you're yeah. going into now, I mean, particularly not necessarily commercial ones, but uh, sort of larger mm. home studio and production studios where you go in and the desk is almost become like a massive coffee table that sits between the speakers, <laughs> you know. Well, that's the thing. I mean, and I'm very much a new school. I'm, I'm, a, you know, a young lad still, just about. And I, I never mixed on a, a large desk myself. And I, um, I find that I, I just desperately try to keep as much clutter off my desk as possible when I'm mixing, because to have something small and simple and reliable right there in front of you to do, as I say, the meat and potatoes work. Um, it doesn't. Um, it, it, some people think, oh, how boring. But on the other hand, if you can get that basic work out of the way you have so much more time to work on the fun stuff so to speak so uh, I, I just find it enormously useful to simplify when it comes to these basic tasks these these kind of things you're going to do in every single mix right george thank you very much i'm guessing uh there's lots of videos tutorial you've done a lot of videos and stuff so i mean people can find all yeah of that exactly on i mean and and of course you know sound examples people can hear the way that the thing sounds they can uh, uh, yeah, they can check out. I've made a bunch of videos demoing a couple of different channel strips and uh, giving you a feel for the sound. So, uh, yeah, softtube.com or our YouTube channel, Twitter, and so on. Yeah. 
Well, George, thanks ever so much for uh, coming on and uh, we will hopefully see you again. It's been a pleasure. Hey, it's been my absolute joy. Thank you very much for having me, Nick. See you next time. Okay, that was our uh, long-distance uh, presentation uh, from George at SoftTube. Uh, if you want to check out Console One, head over to softtube.com and fill your boots. See you next time. <laughs>